Wade was officially placed in command of the Army of the Potomac on June 28th, what would be three days before the Battle of Gettysburg. By the 30th, the two armies had bumped into each other in Pennsylvania, mostly along the border between Emmitsburg, Maryland, and the Pennsylvanian towns of Fairfield and Gettysburg. It was the Union cavalry that probed Lee's infantry, and because Stuart was still away from Lee and not screening the infantry, Pleasanton's troopers were doing what Stuart should have done for Lee. General John Buford could have let the Confederates enter the town as some of Ewell's men had already done a few days before and just watched from the flanks. The veteran Indian fighter decided to occupy and picket the western approaches to town and in the morning initiate a fight with whatever was thrown his way. The crack of carbine in the early morning hours of July 1st 1863 was delivered by Lieutenant Marcellus Jones, an officer of the picket along the Chambersburg Pike, a few miles west of town. That shot was delivered into Confederate General Heath's division, moving in strength up the road, obviously attempting to bully General Buford's men out of the way. Many men in Lee's army had no idea that the Army of the Potomac had caught up to them and thought that the blue-coated uniforms around Gettysburg would have belonged to militia and home guard units. Heath's division, led by General Archer's Alabama and Tennessee brigades, along with General Joseph Davis's Mississippi and North Carolina brigade, slowly pushed Buford's dismounted cavalry back. During this fight, the lead elements of the infantry of the Army of the Potomac under General John Reynolds moved up the several miles from their advance position between Emmitsburg and Gettysburg. The infantry moved past the Lutheran Theological Seminary and relieved the Union troopers not too soon before they may have been driven off. The leading elements belonged to General Cutler's Brigade of Pennsylvania and New York troops and the vaunted and well-known unit of Westerners, often referred to as either the Iron Brigade or Black Hat Brigade, the latter in reference to their distinctive black army hats. The first infantry volley of the battle was appropriately shot by the 56th Pennsylvania on a place just beyond an unfinished railroad cut. The Federals along the cut repulsed Davis and the Iron Brigade slammed into Archer's Brigade in the woods. This close-in fighting would also see the death of the man who was suggested to take command of the Army of the Potomac, Major General John F. Reynolds, commander of the 1st Corps and the Army's left wing. The 11th Corps held as long as the 1st Corps did, but they were being pressed hard and on the flanks. But despite that, would oftentimes charge into the Confederates. One soldier, Sidney J. Richardson of the 21st Georgia Infantry, wrote home of his respect for the men on the 11th Corps front. One Yankee regiment charged us, but we all fell down behind a fence and received the charge first before they got to us. I think they fight harder in their own country than they do in Virginia. I'd rather to fight them in Virginia than here, for we had to leave a great many of our wounded in the hands of the Yankees. The end was slowly coming for the Federals, where many companies and regiments were ceasing to exist. The 24th Michigan Infantry was the cornerstone of the defense in McPherson's woods, and their service exemplifies the courage of the Federal defenders. One soldier, Corporal Orson B. Curtis, wrote of one of several defenses his regiments put up on July 1st. A fifth line of battle where he, Colonel Morrow, planted the colors. On this new line, while waving his sword over his head to rally the men, Captain O'Donnell was instantly killed, and Lieutenant Grace received two wounds, both of which were mortal gradually contesting every foot of ground, step by step, frequently almost surrounded, through and out the woods and over the open field. What was now left of the 24th had been forced back to the friendly rail fence barricade just west of the seminary. In the end, the 24th Michigan sustained 399 losses of 496 men engaged and would retreat from the seminary with only 26 men around the colors. The line at the seminary was flanked on the left by portions of General McGowan's matchless South Carolina Brigade, and about the same time of day, 
Early's division of Ewell's Corps flanked the right of the 11th Corps. The stream of men started to move back through Gettysburg. Regiments on the field that could still form a line often did not want to quit the action. One federal surgeon, James Fulton, of the 143rd Pennsylvania Infantry, wrote of an incident where he encountered some members of the 11th Corps about this time of retreat. I tried to get these poor fellows, 11th Corps men, to go on, make their escape to our lines, they being on the retreat, but I could not get them to move, and many were taken prisoners that night who could easily have made their escape. They had, however, done good work, for had the 11th Corps not come up and supported the right of the 1st Corps in that first day's fight, when General Gordon was trying to get around our right flank, the left being slowly turned all day towards the right, but in helping us, the 11th Corps suffered severely. The Federal soldiers soon found themselves moving rearward, some units in order and some squads of men and individuals making themselves generals and issuing their own commands. When they emerged from the southern end of town, they found General Hancock, commander of the 2nd Corps, who was sent ahead to assume command of the defense of the heights beyond the town and organize the troops coming upon the field. Also there, and somewhat displeased that Hancock commanded the field, was Howard, who assisted in placing troops on the heights of Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, and Cemetery Ridge. It was organized chaos but the calmness of Hancock reassured the men. Meade was moving with the trailing elements of the army and would arrive on the field later that evening. The first day of fighting ended with a Confederate victory, but the bloodletting was unimaginable. The 1st and 11th Corps took approximately 10,000 collective casualties in killed, wounded, and missing. A great many of the Confederate regiments fought on July 2nd and July 3rd so determining their exact casualties on the day is difficult, but some units were torn to shreds. The 26th North Carolina lost almost 600 men in their fight against the Iron Brigade, whereas officers in the Army of the Potomac would show quick and prompt boldness in their command and control, their enemies were for the first time timid. Lee was on the field the night of July 1st with most of his army. Ewell and Hill bore the brunt of the first day's fighting, with Hill's men taking the lion's share of the casualties. Longstreet's corps was mostly stacked up between Chambersburg and Gettysburg, but would be marching through the earliest hours of July 2nd to get on the field ready for action. The men of both armies knew that the next day would bring on the main bout of fighting. The fighting on July 2nd would demonstrate just how good these two armies were at fighting and methodically killing each other. For the civilians who remained in Gettysburg, their homes were becoming hospitals, and there were dead men and horses in the streets and yards. But some tried to just go on and help the wounded when possible. Most of the first part of the day was spent in skirmishing and probing each other's lines. Lee wanted to attack with his whole force, and that depended on Longstreet's men coming up the pike. Due to some errors in marching and unforgivable delays, Longstreet's corps, designed to launch the attack, was delayed. This delay allowed the Army of the Potomac to get more troops into line and fix its position. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.